You've got roped into a last minute show, it's a concert, and there are four single 18 subs that you've got to keep on the ground. Where are you going to put them? Their answer is there's, there's no single perfect sub array for every show, but there is a perfect sub array for your show. It's show goals, the SPL that's needed, the coverage that's needed, the shape of the audience. And today I'm gonna to illustrate all of the underlying principles behind seven different sub setups if you've got four subs. And with more subs, you can get even crazier with it, but with just four, you can do a whole lot to make sure the low end is even where you need it and it's not going on stage where you don't. So we're going to step up in complexity. I'm excited about this one because I think low end is a lot more malleable and also a little bit trickier to control than you think it is. Folks will just throw in front of the stage and have a good night. Um, you can do that, but I think you would like to level up your game and make sure low end is fantastic everywhere. If you are into leveling up your game and learning more about this craft, I also think you would love my audio mass survival spreadsheet. I've got that here. If you're just diving into sound system design, you've got to understand the fundamentals, how sound actually works. You have to make sense of sound. So this spreadsheet here, it's available at the link below or at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit. It gets you understanding how frequency is related to the cycle time or period or wavelength. You can put in a value, it'll spit it back out. You can calculate phase delay. This is really important for aligning mains and subs. You can start to understand decibels a little bit a little bit better and how our linear brain has a hard time calculating that. You can figure out if you need delays, what are comb filters doing? Anyway, there's oh, was over 33, I think now, different calculators in here. I hope you would put them to work. And again, you, get, you can get that at the link below. Okay, so let's jump in how you can get fantastic results with just four subs in seven different ways on your shows. Here we are at Map3D. Let me give you a lay of the land of our file. Then we will jump into seeing each of our seven sub arrays, their pros, their cons, and just basically how can I put four subwoofers to work for me? So I've got four Meyer 750 LFCs. These are a single 18 or maybe even a single 15 inch enclosure, similar in size to a KW181 or a VRX sub or something like that. Our audience is 150 feet by 150 feet. Or I, I'd rather say our prediction plane is because we'll be talking about what is the right audience size or shape for each of these sub arrays. And I also have included here in the back some area just to see how much energy is coming back on stage or off around the stage. Here's our first setup, a classic one, four subs straight across the front of the stage. We've seen this a hundred times, but here I'm going to highlight a key strength of this array. They may not be aware of, but also where it's a double-edged sword, it could be a weakness. So it's evenly spaced. I have them spaced 5.66 feet apart. And why is that? In this setup and all these subs, I'm assuming for this show, my crossover is at a hundred hertz and its wavelength is 11 feet couple inches right and if we are at a half wavelength spacing we're still going to get summation when you interact with something and that's going to be a common theme we're going to be talking about today if the if you're anything within that half wavelength like window is going to get summation and once we get to half we start to get cancellation all right so let's look at this thing 63 hertz here and it's a narrow shape. If you're unfamiliar with this coverage map, zero dB is up at the top, and that's where it's gonna be loudest. And down right here, our lowest point, which is the black, is now 36 decibels down, and it moves in a gradient away from that. So right in the middle is negative 18, and that's our green. So we have lost half our energy by that point. So this subarray is really good at getting narrow. Feels counterintuitive, but the farther you space your subs apart, if they're in a line, the narrower the coverage you're going to get. We have a lot of energy coming back on stage. Sometimes we just have to roll with that. Let's look at 100 now, 100 hertz, which we want to make sure our frequency range all the way up to our crossover, which in this setup is 100 is taken care of. Now it gets even narrower and it has these little cute little wings coming off here and it's shooting right down the center. So this subarray is great for super narrow settings. So if you're running an outdoor concert series, maybe on a baseball diamond, do not use this array. We're gonna talk about what you should use, but do not put them straight across, evenly spaced across the front of the stage. That's a good aesthetic, but doesn't make much sense from a physics standpoint. 
Our next one is a center cube. So I have these four exact same subs put together in a little Tetris block. So looking from the top, they're on top of one another, and here's from the front, they are stacked up. Let's take a look at 63 hertz. So if you could guess that pulling them apart narrows coverage, now we have nice wide even coverage. And this is what you do if you put your subs together. They're gonna couple and the sound is coming from basically the same point. There's not much narrowing at all since they are all close together. This is not a cardioid setup, so we're not getting any rejection in the rear. But what I can say is if my audience was actually this shape of having to cover here all along this, I would definitely go with this two center sub setup because it's gonna propagate evenly throughout and not have a bunch of people getting hammered down the middle and then it be super quiet, 36 dB down on the sides. So that's our center cube. Number three, left, right pairs. We're gonna have them close together. So now we're gonna have two pairs, so they're far apart, but each of their buddies are right here next to them. 63 Hertz. And we see our normal power alleys and valleys coming through here, but that's to be expected. Sometimes we can't put subs in the middle. And so if I did a pair close together, they're going to couple and move out as a single unit. And then I could put another on the other side. They're going to move out as a single unit, but still interact with each other. Let's look at a hundred Hertz. Oh, that was 80. Same thing, we have power alleys, and, power alleys and valleys, but they're cycling quicker since 100 hertz is a shorter wavelength, and that's the type of coverage we're gonna get. It's actually the most even in propagation throughout the sides because of these side lobes here. Now let's move on to number four, a left-right pair. We're actually gonna put five feet of spacing in between them. So this is the same spacing we had all the way in front of the stage, but why might I do this? What if I could get this subarray just to subdivide and conquer. I only wanted to worry about this half of the room if that were our audience shape. And so I can pull it apart to get the narrow its coverage so I have less overlap with the other subarray. 63 hertz. So our power valleys and alleys aren't quite as deep or strong here on the sides. We still have this one definitely that's that's really deep. But I think this one, since we have lessened the amount of overlap between the two, therefore the amount of phase offset and level difference and increase the level difference as they smear across each other, we actually get a better coverage pattern. And just for comparisons, look at 100 hertz too. There we are. So that is narrowing more at a higher frequency and we are getting more, again, slightly more even coverage. And again, I wouldn't go higher than five foot spacing with uh, if it's just those two elements because I don't want the 100 hertz stuff to get super crazy and create these side lobes and get really, really, really narrow. Now let's get funky. Moving on to number six, we have a left-right two element inline gradient array. So if you're unfamiliar with the inline gradient array, I have a video on it on my channel. Just uh, Google my name, inline cardioid sub gradient tutorial, and I'll show you what it is. But we have one sub that's behind the other, and we're using delay on the rear sub and polarity in addition to its physical offset to create a cardioid pattern. So if we have two of these working together, and they're spaced evenly on the, or on, on the sides, if we have them pointing straight forward, we still have a lot of overlap. But what if we could angle them out 45 degrees and maximize their amount of non-overlap with each other? And here's what we get. Not perfect. We still are trading the fact that we have a deeper value, a deeper valley and a little bit wider than our other ones. But everyone here off to the side uh, is is covered better here and then the center uh, and it's a similar depth this is propagating out to versus here and covering a little bit better so it's not perfect but I do have this nice little cone of silence on stage now instead of folks getting hammered by low end since they're right close to the stage again I'm not trying to say here is the best subarray period I just want you to be aware of all the trade-offs and pros and cons when you're thrown into the field Here's the stage, here's four subs, go. Don't deploy the wrong one for the audience shape or the results that you need to get. 
I wouldn't want, I would definitely want a cardioid subarray if I'm running sound for a jazz combo because a open mic and an upright bass is really hard to control. I want to eliminate feedback. So I would say, hey, definitely prioritize cardioid setup so I can get the right level and not get feedback. So that's that setup. Number six, getting even weirder, we, what I'm calling a wide coverage four element inline gradient array. So here's four of them. I'll zoom in a little bit. These are four of these subs. They are now facing each other. So we look at the top. This sub right here is now facing 90 degrees that way, the other one. And same thing here. This one's facing that way. And then the mirror image is true. So that makes the acoustic center of each of these little boxes right here in between them, and then they'll propagate as such. So think of it as almost like a dual 18 sub that we're putting right here, and then another dual 18 sub right behind it, but they're facing each other. So the energy is coming from directly the middle. And then we are also doing an inline cardioid array. So we have our front one right here, and then this one is 4.15 feet behind, and we are also delaying it and doing a polarity inversion to get a cardioid shape. And this is going to get us a nice, narrow, uh, wide pattern that's also a cardioid shape. So if this, if this was my show and this indeed was my audience shape, this is the array that I would to deploy. Since it gives nice, and I couldn't fly it, nice even coverage, this frequency 63 hertz, this shape matches the shape I'm trying to move it through. And now let's look at 100. And it actually gets a little bit flatter. So it's very wide and moving evenly throughout. So there's not a whole lot we can do with any of these subarrays about the front to back level variants because we don't have height. But this has the most even shape at all frequencies within the sub range moving throughout our audience. Now let's flip that. Let's say I did have these four. And now I'm on a super narrow venue. So let's go back to our very first one. If we had four subs evenly across the stage, if we with the spacing them apart narrows coverage, right? If we zoom in here, we could see this sub set up. These are now facing forward now. So we basically have a pair of inline gradient setups right next to each other. And these are again at that five. 0.66 feet spacing, aka a half wavelength apart at 100 hertz. So now I'm getting the benefits of cardioid, but also pulling the part so I can narrow the coverage. So let's take a look at 63 hertz. And I've now narrowed 100 hertz and it's moving closer to and, and not trying to get this whole wide thing. It'd be great for a narrow venue. So that's 63 and it's gonna be a little bit even more narrow here at 100 hertz. So that's a little bit of a mismatch between those two patterns. It's, again, it, it does narrow the, the higher up we go in frequency. It's not a huge way that it, that it starts to narrow, but that's the trade-off with this array is I'm definitely narrowing it, but it's a little bit uneven over frequency because of the wavelengths are different. But that's a trade-off we'll take because I would much rather have the frequency shape be matched to my audience. And if I'm in a enclosed venue, so inside one that's really long, I don't want all this low end bouncing off those walls and then coming back to my audience 30 milliseconds late, right? So I'm eliminating with this setup, the rear wall reflection and getting less energy on stage. I'm getting less energy bouncing off the walls and coming back into my audience. So let's recap each of these seven. We had four straight across, gave us narrow coverage because pulling subs apart ends up narrowing the coverage once you get beyond a half wave or within a half wavelength. Then we have our center cube, each of these four. It's a nice tight, almost like a single sub pattern. It's all coming from the same point in space. It's just this, this sphere radiating out equally in all directions. Then we have our left-right pairs that are close together. And these would radiate like two spheres here equally. So I couldn't put my subs in the center of the stage because there's something blocking it. That left-right one, we'd have power alloys and valleys interacting with each other. But uh, we have equal energy per side. 
Now we can pull them apart a little bit to narrow their coverage now. So they would be responsible for their own specific zones, a little bit less overlap, a little bit less of comb filtering. We had our left, right, two element inline gradient. We have these firing outwards. So they're aiming their cone of silence on the stage to get rejection. We had a pretty big, uh, I'll just show you. We had this guy here, which was consistent over frequency, but it'll start to narrow in size. So it almost looks like an elephant here. And that's our inline gradient. So we are getting it to be very quiet on stage, but we're forced to left, right, and we're decreasing the amount of overlap so we can get only two valleys here instead of a bunch. Then we have a four element. If I can find it. A wide coverage four element which is these guys facing each other. Since the, the acoustic centers of the boxes are close, we're gonna get a more spherical versus a bit a beam of energy. And if we flipped it and had them face forward and put them 5.66 feet apart, we end up narrowing that coverage and also reap the benefits of having a cardioid pattern so we don't have energy on stage. That's it. That is four subs, seven different setups. This isn't exhaustive. I think there's at least seven more you can make with these. But I just wanted to show you the patterns of having close together versus apart, integrating cardioid, not integrating cardioid in order to get the perfect coverage shape for your audience and meet your show goals of maybe an artist wants to feel the energy on stage or not. I'm Michael Curtis. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure and grab my audio mass survival spreadsheet at the link below or at produced by mkc.com slash audio toolkit. I'll catch you on the next one.